for News Prime. This is Joy News Prime. Remember, we are coming to you live from our studios in Accra. You can also view us on the Sky Channel 235 if you are in Europe. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Coming to you uh, this hour, Ghana Ambulance Service says it's, it is in dire need of assistance to effectively respond to emergency situations in the country following its slow response to the Kintampo Tamale accident. Meanwhile, official figures reveal more than 60 people have lost their lives in the MMT bus and tomato truck collision. Also, Deputy Attorney General drags Facebook commentator to court for injuring the former's reputation in an article published on Facebook on the Ameri deal. And in business tonight, Ghana Trade Fair Company recommences search process for an investor to revamp its operations. Still in this bulletin, some opposition political parties threaten to head to court to seek redress if the Electoral Commission fails to disband the controversial steering committee. We'll bring you all the details shortly. Thanks so much for choosing us. Let's begin with teachers across the country who have threatened to embark on a massive strike action at the end of February if monies owed them are not paid. The various teacher groups have been taking turns this week to chastise government on issues relating to unpaid salaries. Over 30,000 teachers have not been paid for two years. The various teacher groups say their members can no longer wait for government to decide on when to pay monies owed them. The teachers say they are tired of setting up committees to look into issues of salaries and arrears, hence will not accept any more roadmaps. The president of the National Association of Graduate Teachers, Christian Adaipoku, says the association has negotiated with government in every way they can to resolve the impasse but to no avail. The first time that we drew a roadmap was November 2014. It was agreed that by June 2015, all these outstanding um, salaries and arrears should have been paid. By June ending, they had not been paid. They were given again up to the end of December 2015 to pay. 2015 December has come and gone. They still have not paid. January has come and gone, and now February is going to end. And so irrespective of the span of time you give them, I think the answer remains the same. What is lacking is the commitment and willpower to pay. And that is what we want to force government to do. We have been working with government over the past two to three years to get teachers who have been employed in the Ghana Education Service be paid their outstanding salary, salaries. And, um, the engagement that have gone on have ended up in National Labor Commission issuing out directives here and there. But eventually all of them have been disregarded by government to the extent that um, over 30,000 teachers still suffer from various forms of arrears that government has failed to pay. So all the teacher unions have met and have taken a decision that government has up to the end of this month to make payment of all outstanding uh, salaries and allowances. If they don't do it, then after the end of this month, teachers will start our uh, industrial action. He says the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission, the Ministry of Employment and Labour Relations, the Ministry of Education, Audit Service and Control and Accountant General's Department have not attached any urgency to resolving their issues, hence their decision to embark on the strike. The teachers are further threatened to quit teaching for as long as they need to if government refuses to pay them. But we are stating the realities on the ground. Since our minister came into office, teachers were so happy to see our own. That is somebody who has been a teacher herself and actually has trained teachers. We're expecting her to be able to appreciate our problems better and to help solve them. But since he came, she came, 
she has not been able to initiate even a single policy that is geared towards motivating teachers, I mean, enhancing teachers' welfare and making sure that teachers um, have peace of mind to be able to do their work. All her concentration has been on supervision. On Wednesday, the Coalition of Concerned Teachers Online similar intent to quit teaching if their arrears are not paid. The embattled new medical superintendent of the Upper West Region Hospital, Dr. Banabas Gandal, has been sworn into office despite agitations by some staff over his appointment. Since Monday, some nurses and doctors have refused to work to protest to Gandal's appointment. They prefer Dr. Chris Opokufofie, a gynecologist at the hospital, who they say has labored enough and therefore deserves that position. However, earlier today, Dr. Gandal was introduced to the staff of the hospital, although the event was boycotted by some unit heads of that hospital. Despite the continuous protest from the leadless nursing group of the Upper West Regional Hospital, lecturer at the University for Development Studies Medical School and head of the gynecology and obstetric unit of the Tamil Teaching Hospital, Dr. Barnabas Gandao, was inducted into office. The induction ceremony which was not open to the media, was to be attended by all unit heads of the hospital. However, it was poorly attended as majority of the unit heads of the hospital failed to turn up. Dr. Barnabas Gandao, who is fully employed by the UDS Medical School and now on secondment at the hospital, took over the mantle of leadership of the hospital from Dr. William Dodu. Speaking in an exclusive interview with Joy News, the new medical superintendent was full of praise for the nurses, even though they were against him. I was happy once at once the people of the Upper West Region demonstrated their appreciation for what a son of Ghana has done for them, even against their own son. That is what made me happier because it shows that, yes, being from Upper West Region doesn't mean that we cherish you better than those who have worked from here, whether they are from uh, Northern Region, Eastern Region, uh, Volta Region, or whatever. In any case, he has helped and he will continue helping to build the Upper West Region. Dr. Gandalf promised not to witch hunt any of the nurses who took part in the protest. I come here to work with everybody. I also said I don't have enemies, only friends yet to be known. And if it is for the sake of this hospital, I'm ready to work with any perceived uh, enemy. No, not to me. Maybe that person may have that uh, feelings towards me. I open up my heart to work with everybody. I have a saying that, look, even you are ugly, and I know that your work is well done. I will appreciate it officially and then personally. If you are beautiful, especially the women, or handsome, as well as the few men that are handsome, and you do something wrong, I will rebuke you officially and personally because this job is not mine, it's for government. He then laid his plans for the hospital. I'm bringing on board all the inclusiveness of all staff, taking advantage of the strengths that the hospital has, the opportunities that the hospital has, and then making sure that we overcome the challenges and the weaknesses that we have in terms of human resources, in terms of consumables in terms of uh, utility issues, in terms of statutory payment issues, all this stem down to the fact that the hospital has probably little, has problem with generation of funds, generation of internal generator funds, certain and due to lack of specialized services that can give us better claims from national health insurance. On his relationship with Dr. Chris Opoku Fofie, the preferred candidate of the nurses, he stated that they were schoolmates in Cuba 
and have no ill feeling against him. Reporting for the news, Rafik Salam. Wah. And in the crowd, my name is Aisha Brian. 5,000 graduates and youth are expected to be rolled out in new agribusiness internship programs across the country. The Project Entrepreneurship for Opportunity Actualization Up Act is focused on building the entrepreneurial and vocational skills of young people to take advantage of opportunities in horticulture, livestock and grain subsectors within the vast agricultural industry. Funded by the USAID under its Africa Lead program, EOPACT will engage individuals in on-the-job internship programs at various firms where they will acquire hands-on vocational and managerial skills. The project will help SMEs working in the agribusiness sector and looking for improved technologies and innovations, an opportunity to be attracted to firms to acquire their skills and improve on their operational capacities. This project is designed such that we first of all look for firms that are looking for people to employ or they can offer training, apprenticeship. Once we get the firms, we look at their needs. Then we send out the application for the young ones to apply. We are looking for university graduates, polytechnic graduates, uh, um, agri school graduates, uh, excuse me to say, illiterate rural youth. Anybody, once you can, you can send in your application, you are called. We are targeting 5,000 youth to get them uh, placement. And some will, will go into production of certain agricultural commodities which we have identified market and they will produce and supply specific markets. What we're also looking for is to get other packages that if somebody goes through that internship and wants to set up a business, is there any soft landing pad that the person can get some kind of an innovative fund or a startup fund and a startup kit? And not only fund, but it's, it's a full package. You have the, uh, the technical support, you have the business management support, and then you have some working capital or funds to start your business. Those are the things that we also want to speak to the right agencies and institutions to see what kind of program and um, what, what kind of products we can we can bring out. Acting Chief Executive of the Youth Employment Agency, Kobina Bichim, also announced the new YEA modules, which have been opened to the public. They include youth in security, youth in coastal sanitation, youth in agriculture and youth in afforestation. So the strategy we adopted was to create modules which essentially mirror sectors of the economy and society. Okay. So some of these are youth in agriculture module, the youth in health, youth in security, youth in afforestation, afforestation, greening Ghana, youth in education, youth in coastal sanitation, youth in sanitation, youth in paid internship, and youth in trades and vocations. As uh, we go along, uh, any innovative modules that we can develop that will result in the employment of more youth, we will develop and add it to. Um, our list of modules. We are essentially rolling out the programs in a phased manner. We can't we can't unleash everything on the We apologize for the break-in transmission. We're still on Joy News Prime. Let's we'll be, now it's time for business and uh, Abu Ajiri, I, Abu Ajiri, Abu Ajiri. <laughs> I know. But Joe, what's, what's coming up for well, business? Well, in business, the Ghana Trade Fair company, earlier on, the speculations that the company has been sold out to a Dubai company or investor to actually revamp the activities in the, in the yard. But it looks like the authorities have debunked that assertion. That assertion. Exactly. Well, That's so it. let's hear more of that. All right. Thank you very much. Now it's now time for business. The Ghana Trade Fair Company has begun a new process in search of an investor to revamp its operations. Managers of the facility, which has in recent years been saddled with huge debts and operational challenges, are now hoping to invite bids by next month and settle on an investor within the next six months. Etonam C was at the trade fair site and has come through with this report.
This is the Ghana International Trade Fair Center located here in Accra. The 120-acre site of the company now appears rather abandoned with the grass in the lawn withering away. A number of facilities at the once vibrant site are no longer in operation. But speaking to Joy Business, the acting chief executive, Dr. Erasmus Kony, refuted claims that the company has already been sold to some Dubai investors. The plain fact is that last year, the government identified an investor. And so a transaction advisor, PwC, was set up. What happened is that, you know, when you know, we go to Dubai, they shifted the goalpost. So I think the minister said that was enough. So he decided that, you know, the PPP approach should be adopted. So no sales went on. Tenants at the trade fair premises are expected to be officially served with eviction notices in six months' time. A visit to the facility by Joy Business, however, revealed similar notices already pasted around, and Dr. Kuni explained the rationale behind this move. The moment, no, no the, place, the place has not been sold. It's, the notice merely stated that, you know, it was a notification that they should prepare their minds that in about six months, it's likely that we would have found an investor. So uh, an agreement will be made with the investor for a date setting. So this was just a notification for them to prepare their minds. Government abrogated the initial deal with some Dubai investors in the latter part of November last year after about eight months of negotiations. According to the Ghana Trade Fair Company, recent reports that the facility has been sold to some investors unduly affected its operations. All right, now the Minister of Trade and Industry, Dr. Eko Spilgabra, is urging investors to take advantage of the business opportunities provided by Ghana's agri sector. According to him, the sector remains largely untapped, a phenomenon investors could capitalize on. He was speaking at the first in the series of networking events organized by the Ghana South Africa Business Chamber in partnership with Joy Business. We want to be as competitive as any other West African country. And the South Africans have done their own analysis. That's why you hear them saying they want Ghana to be the focal point and a hub for their business. The Italian Prime Minister was here only two weeks ago and he said they've selected Ghana and Botswana as the two countries for Italy to do most of their business in Africa. So other countries are doing the analysis and they reach, they end up concluding that Ghana is the place to be. The natural resources of Ghana are already well known, so it depends on what kind of agri sector one wants to go into. And so we can't really get into the specifics. Is it the rubber sector? Is it oil palm? Is it fruits and vegetables? Is it, you know, um, other kinds of horticulture or root crops, yams, cassava, etc. So depending on the sector that the, a particular investor wants to get into, is there some special incentive they need to make that investment with? They negotiate it with the Ghana Investment Promotion Center, but otherwise there's a wide range of tax-free and other capital um, credit opportunities that are available in our investment code. Traders at the Agwagulushi market are warning the prices of tomatoes are likely to double in the coming weeks. A Greek information service provider Isoko Ghana has also predicted an increase in the prices of tomatoes and some grains in the weeks ahead. So what exactly could be driving these factors? Details in this business desk report. More than half of the local demand for tomatoes is imported from Burkina Faso using the CFA franc. The value of the CD has, however, been declining against the CFA franc. This means the traders would need more CFA francs to import the same quantity of tomatoes they have been importing. According to them, this coupled with the rising cost of transportation are bound to lead to the expected increases in the prices of the products. I see from December 20th. From the month of December to May, all the tomatoes are imported from Burkina Faso. So if the safer goes up, we will also increase the prices. And the more I say fair cost run, it will be cost. Nowadays, the crate sells at 60,000 CIFA. When we factor in our transport and duties, it amounts to about 400 Ghana cities. But we sell it at 250 Ghana cities. So for this tomato business, we are only incurring losses. 
A Greek information service provider, Isoko Ghana, in its latest commodity index also says the poor rainfall pattern so far recorded may lead to low yields. Speaking to Joy Business, senior business advisor George Kote Nikoi explained this would eventually push the prices of tomatoes and some grains upwards. The rainfall pattern, yes, was not that good last year. And this year, after harvest and looking at how things have gone so far, it will affect our grains, especially maize. And then tomato too will be affected. It too, currently, tomato prices are going down because of the influx of the irrigated ones. But as it gets exhausted in the system, the price will hit rocket high. The next two months, it should hit around 500 going to 600. Per okay. okay. And we know tomato is a perishable product. You can't store it for long. So until we get our processing plants running to absorb some of these things, the, most of them will get uh, perish, and the price will go up. There are fears Ghana's unfavorable climate may affect not only prices of the foodstuff, but also already resulted in acute water shortages across some parts of the country. Now away from that, prices of cocoa on the international market are now expected to pick up above the $3,000 mark. This follows weeks of price decline attributed to a pickup in shipments in December last year. The fear of a production shortfall is, however, pushing up prices. More in this business report. After rising through 2015, cocoa prices went down more than 15% at the beginning of 2016. This was as a result of increase in supplies. However, an unexpected delay in the dry season here in West Africa has caused market watchers to revise prospects for the 2016 crop season, pushing prices up. Global banking and financial company Commerce Bank last week, for instance, warned that hopes of a recovery for Ghana's 2015 poor output was fading. It warned that production in Ghana would most likely not reach last year's output of 750,000 because of the extended dry spell. The latest development, although not exciting for international buyers, may somewhat be a good one for Ghana, where declining prices were expected to impact negatively on the economy. The commodity is currently trading at $2,894 a ton on the international market. Now still in business, the perception that the growth of mobile money services could negatively affect the operations of banks may not be true after all. A recent report by rating agency Moody's is rather lending credence to the argument that it would rather provide banks with opportunities. Here in Ghana, mobile money service is said to be doubled or to have doubled over the past five years. So exactly how could banks exploit the opportunities presented mobile money service Nana Utua Champong? is a banking analyst. It is key in the sense that um, mobile money or mobile payment system is a part of the banking infrastructure or the banking system where you are trying to get money, uh, depositors money in and making payments for a commission. So it's part of the services that the financial services institutions such as the bank uh, is providing so they, they, they cannot do without um, or they cannot turn a blind eye to that side, blind eye to that side of the business. And so they are, it is key to their development uh, in robbing in more uh, customers. So as the Moody's report shows that um, worldwide, they, there's only a 2% increase in new account openings. Whereas if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, especially in Kenya, is 58 percent. So you can see that more people are now accessing formal banking system, and that is because they started through this micro money transfer uh, mobile money system, and now they've seen the benefit, and gradually they are moving into uh, the big players. So it is very, very key to the development of the system. Well, and that wraps up the business segment for tonight. Thank you very much for your company. Keep watching the news. My name is Emmanuel Abwaji Riafi. 
If you just joined us, this is Joy News Prime. Now to the rest of our stories. The National Ambulance Services say it is in dire need of assistance to be able to effectively respond to emergency situations in the country. The service has come under fire for what many describe as slow response to the carnage on the Kintampo Tamale stretch that has so far claimed at least 60 lives. The chief executive officer of the National Ambulance Service, Professor Ahmed Zakaria, told Joy News the country's emergency system, as it stands, is weak. Where the accident took place is around Kintampo, and normally we have an ambulance station in Kintampo. So although the personnel were there, their vehicle was out of commission because it was due for servicing and it was sent um, to Accra. So it means that the only option left is to deploy the ambulances from the neighboring towns like Techima um, and then neighboring countries like uh, Brekum and the rest. So basically, in this particular case, the response time was um, very long because the ambulances there definitely, like I did explain, was not available. Emergencies are unexpected and dangerous situations that mm -hmm. call for immediate action. Mm -hmm. And so if we say because one is out of service, because of that I mean a community of about or a town of about 40 people, there, there's no ambulance, one single ambulance, you know, to, to respond to any emergency situation. Saying you are talking about the district, some districts don't even still have at all. So if you were allocating resources and you have districts that are yet to benefit from the service, they don't have, it will be very selfish to give two to a particular situation, you understand? So what I'm trying to explain is that the ideal situation is that every district's capital should have had the benefits of the service. And then you go the step further to ensure that there is a standby vehicle for each of those ambulances. Um, snail space is, 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 is the term you would prefer to use. But definitely under the circumstances, I would not call it snail space. But Prof, you have admitted that it took a long time for you to respond to this situation. We've received reports that it took your, your, your team 12 hours for the first ambulance to for, for the first ambulance to to get to the to the accident scene and i mean this is an emergency to, situation you and i know emergency situations call for immediate action and if it has to take about 12 hours felix once again it's because you are refusing to put things in perspective because the reality is that go back to your map and you look at the distribution of the various vehicles it's not like they are all just seated together and immediately they will have to be deployed. And other, the other reason is that all these vehicles were also for emergencies in their various localities and locations. And so let's assume that Techima is being deployed to send a case to, let's say, Konfanochi, for example. And it's the same vehicle that will have to come back and go to Kintampo. Definitely the response will delay. I mean, we've spoken about the fact that the vehicle at, I mean, the, um, your ambulance at Kentampo was out of service. Do you know how long it had been out of service for? No, but what will that answer be? Because the reality is that, once again, answers like this will not help us because across the country, and I don't want to, because you see, I don't want to be very reactive. One thing I find curious, and I mean, I ask you, don't you find it irrational that, you know, the reports that you know it took 12 hours for the first ambulance to arrive there i mean you are the expert yourself if it takes 12 hours for i mean i understand the things you've said the challenges you're facing and all but even in spite of that if it has to take 12 hours for you to respond to an emergency situation i mean no, I, I, I'm so, i still disagree if you use adjectives like irrational no because then you are distorting the whole this argument because the reality is that you should find out what really are the issues on the ground. Was there any response at all? If there was ever any response, what were the challenges that led to the response of these 12 hours you are talking about? So but judging from what you've said so far and considering what do you know and I mean the resources you have, to deal with emergency situations, would you say our emergency response system is, is strong or weak? 
Ooh, I will tell you it's weak because cross over to our correspondent in the Brown Hafo region where Anna Sabe joins us with the latest on the accident that claimed uh, over 60 lives. Good evening to you, Anas. Uh, what more can you tell us? What's the latest uh, on this incident? Well, I said the latest uh, from the uh, hospital, King Tampo Government Hospital, is that uh, the eight people have been confirmed uh, dead uh, at the hospital. But this is disclosed uh, to us by the uh, medical doctor, the uh, doctor Omusu Fosu. And uh, out of the injured, uh, most of them have been uh, transferred to the Africa Hospital. Some are here. Six of them are in Tichiman at the Holy Family Hospital, with uh, several others are transferred to uh, Kumasi and then Accra, as well as Sunyani. Uh, currently, as we speak now, we have only two among the injured uh, or among those uh, who were able to survive uh, currently at the Kintampo government hospital. So this is the latest from Kintampo. Only two of the survivors are currently with the Kintampo government hospital with 68 confirmed dead. And we cannot tell, uh, the figures keep varying. We can't see whether uh, some have lost their lives uh, elsewhere as uh, they've been transferred to other hospitals. Earlier on, we were told or we heard about a three-month uh, baby who has survived. What more can you say about this? Can you confirm? Yeah, that's very true. Uh, that's uh, very true. One of the survivors uh, disclosed to us that uh, uh, three months, baby, even though we, I haven't seen the baby, but uh, one of the survivors confirmed. And then uh, he also had uh, a couple of uh, other, you know, uh, young babies also lost their lives. But the three months, old baby who survived have been confirmed someone survived thank you very much anna sabet for the update we'll be calling you for more in our subsequent bulletin meanwhile the management of the metro mass transit limited in a statement signed by management says whilst it leaves the ghana police to do their investigations mmt would also use its internal mechanisms to do in-depth investigations into the road traffic crash the MMT also says it is taking steps to take up the medical bills which would arise as a result of the road crash. When we heard the news late last night, it came as a shock to us. We didn't know the cause of the crash. And so we quickly set up a committee to investigate into the issue. So that is what we've done as of now. A committee is looking into the issue. How often do you service your, your vehicles? Aside um, servicing the bus every month, we have daily checks before the bus moves. We check on the bus daily before it moves. Aside the monthly checks that we have on the buses. We have a technical department that handles the whole check-in system. But they are engineers, they know how to go about their work, and so we leave it to them to do the checks, the technical checks. What have you gathered so far, let me put it? Well, our officers who were at the scene last night said they were 53, but as of now, like some few minutes ago when I spoke to one of them, it's 71, reported dead with a couple of injuries. We'll wait for the committee to bring their report, and then we'll make it public. How soon? By How soon? The, well, by the end of the month, the report should be out. We'll take a break. We'll be back with the international news. This is Joy News Prime now to recap stories making headlines and ambulance service says it is in dire need of assistance to effectively respond to emergency situations in the country following its slow response to the Kintampo Tamale accident. Meanwhile, officials uh, say figures reveal more than 60 people have lost their lives in the MMT bus and tomato truck collision. Also, Deputy Attorney General Drugs Facebook commentator to court for injuring the former's reputation in an article published on Facebook on the Ameri deal. In business, Ghana Trade Fair Company recommences search process for an investor to revamp its operations.
and some opposition political parties threaten to head to court to seek redress if the Electoral Commission fails to disband the controversial steering committee. We'll bring you more on Joy News Prime, but now Lord Harrison Edwasar is here to tell us what's coming up on DNI. Aisha, good evening. Good evening to you. Well, you know everyone is talking about... Are you about... not celebrating your Valentine? <laughs> <laughs> no, Aisha. Okay, it's, it's a, I understand. It's a dark, dark Thursday. It's a dark I Thursday, know. I understand. So, well, last month a gentleman was arrested and prosecuted for posting on Facebook that he would shoot U.S. Ambassador to Ghana, Robert Porter Jackson. Today, Deputy Attorney General and Member of Parliament for Bogatanga East, Mr. Dominic Ayine, has filed a defamation suit at an Accra High Court against a Facebook commentator, Evron Hughes. So, do you still believe you can freely air your views on social media? To your opinion, if you go saying the right thing, that you don't like saying something that you have evidence for, it, why not? You are entitled to your opinion because that is your opinion. And earlier in the day, social media platforms were blocked in Uganda as their presidential elections got underway to stop people from telling lies. When I return a little over 30 minutes, I'll be taking your comments, including the latest on the death toll of the Metro Mass Transport accident on our social media platform. The entire segment is brought to you by Etel. Over to you, Aisha. Indeed, uh, Lord uh, Edo Asari will be bringing you more on Joy News Interactive. Let's do more on Joy News Prime. The Electoral Commission has rubbished calls by major political parties and election observers to dissolve its 18-member steering committee. The New Patriotic Party, People's National Convention and the Progressive People's Party, PPP, are demanding the immediate dissolution of that committee set up by the EC to help steer the conduct of the November 7 polls. Now, Wednesday, a Deputy General Secretary of the NDC, George Lawson, confirmed Dr. Ahin is a member of the NDC, but insists the governing party had no hand in his appointment to the steering committee of the Electoral Commission. Since this revelation, other parties have joined the fray and demand the dissolution of the committee since it could not be trusted to be an impartial body. But the EC says the calls have no basis. In an interview with Joy News, Public Affairs Director of the Electoral Commission, Christian Ousopari, says the selection to the committee was purely based on the choice of the institution. Thus, the EC has no reason to doubt the integrity or know the political leanings of the selected persons. To have a committee of this nature. What really, uh, tell me, Mr. Ousopari, what really are they going to add to, to, to the work of the commission? No. A lot, Kwachi. The experience of 2014 when we had to reschedule registration because our, our program ran counter to the program of the GES. We were forced at that time to reschedule registration of voters. If we want the police, of course we have to go through the police hierarchy. And if there is somebody from the police on the committee, he is in position to tell us when the police intends to do A or B, and uh, if he is aware or he has full knowledge of the commission's program, he is able to bring it to the notice of the police administration that the Electoral Commission plans to have this particular exercise that would involve the police at this material time. The political parties say that you did not consult them. You see, parties, a lot of things are done administratively. And so if there is an administrative decision that has to be made by the commission, I do not think that such administrative issues always have to go to the political parties to uh, say we agree or we don't agree. These are administrative decisions that the commission is empowered by the constitution to make. Even in a critical, crucial election as this one, you don't, the electoral commission does not see the need to have consulted the political parties on this? Why we would consult them on all issues, in fact, all key issues. But it is not every every decision that the commission makes that we say we are going to political parties for approval before we do it. Let 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 us have some kind of uh, space to work as an election management body, and let us take those administrative decisions that we think uh, will be 
in the interest of our election. The, the most controversial aspect of this 18-member committee is about the appointment of some persons, some political parties have described as known members of the NDC, Dr. Karl Marx, for example. To, to, to respond simply, uh, I'll say that the, the commission has no knowledge of any member being a member of a political party. Uh, what we did, what we did when we conceived the idea of forming this committee was that we wrote to the institutions to give us uh, one person to represent them on the committee. So the selection was purely the decision of those um, institutions. But at least two political parties, the MPP and the PNC, have indicated their resolve to go to court to seek redress if the matter is not resolved at an emergency IPAC meeting scheduled for Friday. There is no way better than the appointment to describe the response from the Electoral Commission. Because, look, every step, every um, turn is important in this process. And so, for me, uh, the point I need to stress on is the fact that, look, the Electoral Commission should not begin to do something. That would generate suspicion. Already, uh, political parties are beginning to raise very genuine concerns. And for the Electoral Commission to come up, with this response, for me, confirms the fact that uh, they are not really interested in considering political parties as shareholders or, or as partners. Because if something such as that which we have just witnessed has happened and concerns have been raised, to the extent that uh, members of the NDC and even the individuals involved themselves meet and have even moved further to say we are resigning, the Electoral Commission is pretending that they don't know what is going on and that they haven't received any official communication. The court will be the last resort if push comes to shove. But tomorrow, we are having an iPad meeting. And trust me, we will be loudest, we will be vociferous, and we will be demanding of the Electoral Commission to begin to do things that will excite confidence from all. And that will begin with the Electoral Commission disbanding this group and allowing us to be part of the process of reconstituting it, if the reconstitution of that group is even made. I, 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 I can assure you that that point will be vociferously made. If nobody at all makes it, I will do so. And we'll be demanding that, look, as a first point, towards having a successful, peaceful, and, and, and transparent election, this particular committee must be disbanded. They must stop this presence of saying they don't know that the person is an NDC man and that the various institutions haven't written to them as regards the individuals whose identities have been discovered. Look, once we start on this pretentious note, what it means is that uh, we are whittling away confidence people have in the Electoral Commission and by extending the entire process. That is a dangerous trend. That uh, argument. The, the explanation that the EC has provided is that they, that, they that, only that, wrote to these institutions. They it's did not. It's untenable and unacceptable. They are just exposing themselves to public radical and contempt. You might to take that stand. I told you the other day that I don't. I mean, from, from look of things, it was the NDC as a party who selected those names and handed over the names to the EC. I got them. I'm throwing that challenge to them. I'm throwing that challenge to them. A, a, a baseless and a needless and a useless body. Baseless, needless, and useless. I'm a false one. It has no credibility at all. I mean, the names have better things to be thinking of. The Deputy Attorney General and uh, Member of Parliament for Bolga Tanga East, Dominic Kayene, has filed a defamation suit at an Accra High Court against a Facebook commentator, Evron Hughes. In Ms. Ayene's statement of claim, he accused Mr. Hughes of defaming him in a post he uttered and published on Facebook on December 21, 2015, titled The Ameri Transaction. According to the Deputy AG, uh, the on quote, he says, false and malicious, unquote. Uh, post has provoked, quote, public dissatisfaction, unquote, against him and exposed him to public ridicule and contempt. The Deputy Attorney General, among other reliefs, is praying the court to declare that the publications to the effect that plaintiff is corrupt, a thief and fraudulent are defamatory. He also wants an injunction restraining the defendant whether by themselves, their servants or agents or otherwise from authorizing, permitting and or causing to be published the same or similar words defamatory of the plaintiffs.
So other news, a British MP for Hackney North and Stroke Newington in the UK recently tweeted, uh, unquote, it's not just multinationals like Google ripping off the British taxpayer. Ghana loses $2.6 billion of tax in sweetheart deals. Unquote. This tweet caught the curiosity of many generating debate. Diane Abbott is in Ghana and Joy News has been finding out exactly what her comment means and whether they are based on facts available to her. It's true. Research has shown that Ghana loses billions of dollars in tax revenue because of sweetheart deals and tax evasion. And I want to work with organizations like ActionAid Ghana to see what can be done and to encourage the government, if necessary, to renegotiate some of these deals. So you said research, so it means that you have evidence that oh, backs? Yes. Oh yes, I work with organizations in the UK who have researched it. And the figure I give, which is over two billions, is a figure that's based on research. Okay, so it means that there can be more than 2.6 billion dollars that we are losing? I don't know what the exact figure is, but we're talking about billions of dollars lost through unfair taxation treaties and sweetheart deals with multinational companies. ActionAid Ghana has done the research. This is their figure. That's why I'm here meeting with them to find out the detail. In the UK, did the research which showed that Ghana is losing billions through tax evasion and unfair taxation treaties. So I'm here to meet with ActionAid Ghana to find out the detail. The sweetheart deal is when the benefits to the multinational are disproportionate and outweigh the benefits to the country that has offered the deal. So in the UK, we have a sweetheart deal with Google, where Google pays hardly any tax in the UK. But this is something the British public wants something done about. What, what is the government doing about it, as I said now? And uh, what are the policies that we put in place to help solve this issue? I think we need to look at taxation treaties. And we look, need to look at some of the ways that companies evade tax. And I think both in the UK and in Ghana, we need stronger tax avoidance measures in our legislation. OK, thank you very much. But Ghana loses $2.6 billion. Who are we losing the money to? And, and other companies, or who and what are we losing the, the money to? The figures, over $2 billion, apply to a whole range of companies. But as I say, this is research done by ActionAid in the UK. And I've come here to ActionAid Ghana to find out the detail. We'll be back with the entertainment segment. Entertainment news is brought to you by... Time now for entertainment and Miss G is here. Hi, Miss G. Hello, Aisha. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I love your earrings. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. So what's Shatawale saying this time? Okay, so Shatawale and Bull House Entertainment no, fell out from some months ago, you mm. know, I think in October last year. And after working for about three years with the... Uh, the entertainment house. Now, after falling out, we've had a lot of story back and forth with Bulldog. First of all, the accusation that he had plotted something against Bulldog's wife and was leaking her nude picture. This time around, there's an audio that has gone viral. And what's in this audio? You want to know? Hmm. He's telling people why, why are you following Shatta, you know why? They have got my fans already. If it wasn't me, I don't think he would know you. Yeah. Yeah, you know, so you shouldn't try and be saying things you know, he thinks he has got for you or something for you. You know, you got so otherwise no otherwise I'll let you go and report that he's with you, I swear. <laughs> I know so that so that you so that you, so that you, so that you see that you you love me, like you like yeah, you don't want anything to happen to it can be like pressuring people like that around me. Yeah. All the people that you can, you know, there are people that you were on my page looking for them. So this is what happened. It is alleged that Shatawali plays the call to a female fan who is a common friend to, to Bull House Dog. Entertainment okay. and also to Shatawali. Mm. Now the call was to plot a rape, you know, against uh, plot rape against Kendrick. 
who is the CEO of Bull House Entertainment. Mind you, Bulldog is not the CEO of Bull House of, Entertainment, of Bull House but Entertainment. Kendrick Yehoa Damik is, is the, the CEO. CEO. And so this call was to plot some rape against him. So he and the girl, was the, the lady fan, were discussing on the phone. On the phone. As to who leaked this audio, conversation. we do not know. But the conversation, of course, got to the camp of Bull House Entertainment, and Kendrick didn't take it lightly. He took to his Facebook post uh, page to post something about how he met Bulldog, how, uh, sorry, how he met Shatawali, Wally. how his outfit was the first to accept him when he didn't even have a Togo stamp in his passport, <laughs> took him beyond, you know, Ghana, shot his first video for him, you know, got him media hype and all that, reminding Shatawali of all the good things that the Bull done, House has, has done, done for him. him. So we are here to hear from the camp of Shatawali. They say that they have not received or heard of the video or the audio so and they don't know anything they don't about know anything it. about it and but so it looks like his voice well it sounds like him but in this time when you can doct uh, you have doctored voices you can really be sure that be sure, that is Shatawali yeah, so sure. it's alleged that that was Shatawali having a conversation okay. with a lady mm. over the phone okay now Aisha <laughs> Sonny Badu is in the news and Sonny Badu is saying to you and I that we should stop criticizing pastors who live luxurious lives you know we should stop criticizing them because that is the pay for their long suffering he says that after a pastor you know goes through all the hard times it is good that he you know spends also some money his on life. himself okay. and so well since if you do church members walk to church and join trotro queues well that's well, what Sonny Badu is I'm saying. sure that word is for you. Mm. He says, stop criticizing them because you do I not know the story anybody. I'm behind just, I'm the just glory. Asking questions he says I want that to know. every good thing that comes to a pastor that you see or you, or you call luxurious, it's compensation from God, God for the hard work and for all the troubles they go through as pastors. I don't think nobody has criticized any pastor for, well, not that I know of, mm -hmm. but I'm sure everybody who does that has one reason or the other. I don't think they just get up and start criticizing them because they're jealous of the cars they're driving or something. What do you think? Well, I think same as well, but that is an about submission. He actually told the story of himself, how he began sleeping in buses, even the fact that Preaching he went the to, word of God. Yes. And even before he became a preacher, when he was that young, and uh, how he even went to his ex's house, and the ex mother told him never to step foot in the house again. And he was saying that it was all part of the plan. Today, here is Sonny Badu, international gospel art. You can't take it away from him. And he's but enjoying he had to his go lunch. through that. So he's enjoying his luck. <laughs> so so don't you be don't jealous. know the story <laughs> what he's behind the glory. Anyway. Basically, that's what he's been saying. Well, he, he has a point. But, yeah. Um, there's more to it. I think there'll be so, time to discuss all of that. <laughs> true, true. There'll be time to discuss all of that. Yesterday, I told you about the fact that Juliet Ibrahim, during Salma Mumin's uh, No Man's Land, said that new crop of producers are the ones making the Ghana music industry vibrant and actually selling it out to the world. If you missed out on that audio, here's an interview with Joy News. We, the young movie makers today, are the ones putting Ghana movie industry on the map out there. When I go to Nollywood, if I travel outside, people get to hear about Ghana movie industry just because, oh, they hear that I'm a celebrity from Ghana. So um, with these movies, we can also sell our country positively to the world. People need to understand that we're not, it's not all about us being, um, you know, all glamorous and everything, but we, we can use our movies as a platform or a form of tourism for the country in every way possible, you know. Yes! Would you disrespect me? Uh, all right, so that's the Diabolo's response. But uh, sorry, that's Juliet Ibrahim. Now, this comment by Juliet got Diabolo, Bob Smith Jr., if you remember him, now you're a war. Your war, you know. <laughs> he got him quite infuriated. He says that that's arrogance, to say the least. Hmm? She want to mean that her predecessors did not do enough for her to take the pattern. You remember Kwanzaa's Love Brood, Heritage, and all those big movies. They hit international standard, and it's a Ghanaian movie. Even before some of us came, others came, and then Juliet and the rest have come. They have just come. I find such a statement too presumptuous on the part of an artist who has become a star not too long ago. You make a statement like this, and then the public gets mad at you, and nobody wants to see you on the screen again. Let her apologize. It is not the best thing to 
Maybe she should apologize. Well, so she's... there's more drama let, in the movie industry. Let peace prevail. <laughs> you know, well, I'm just hoping that, you know, another young art comes to say something to contradict him, and then we have another <laughs> but, older but one. I don't think she was saying it in a bad context. I, well, I don't really think she was saying that the predecessors didn't do anything. True. In, that's the truth. The well, young ones are now ruling the world. Hmm. You've had your time. So no. let the young well, I uh, mean the young ones. I hope you don't get irritated when the young ones begin to tell you that when you're an old I lady. I don't think so. Okay. At all. So let's go back to Peace Squad. <laughs> Yesterday I told you about you know some fire in the camp of the Okoye family mm. and it's still on. Well, today it's tempers have been calm. Now, you know, yesterday I told you that Paul has said that he wanted to change management. He had yeah. issues with his senior brother, Jude Okoye. Yes. And we were all wondering what, that was Peter yesterday. Okay. We we're all wondering what Paul's stance will be okay. as of today. Mm. Now, Paul comes to say that, look, he's having his big brother's back anytime, any day. Now, he goes ahead and puts a sound system, a studio art in place of Peter in a group photograph they took and says that family is family, blood is it's blood. Yes, water. blood is blood. And so if you say you're not doing business with family, what am I to you? That's okay. a question he asks his other twin. And then his twin comes to say, this is the disgrace for you. you. want to disgrace me. You want everybody to say that that is Peter always ranting on Twitter mm -hmm. anyway. All the best to you, bro. Then I think he was advised later on. And he comes back apologizing to everybody and says that I'm human. Sometimes I get you wrong. So that's it for the drama in the Okoye well, family. It's interesting. I mean, twins. They are twins. They're twins. Right? Peter and Paul. It, it's, it's, it's interesting. I've not seen twins who fight like that. Well, this that. is business minded <laughs> twins, you know. So, for all you know, it's business fights. And uh, I, I having your senior brother managing you, sometimes, you know, he would like to tell you, sit down and get up and, and all that. And, and you, and feel you like, also feel you're I a big the artist guy. who makes the money, you know. So, I pay you. But, but you no know, big manager brother business. is a manager. You anyway. That so that's well. the point of entertainment. Mm -hmm. It was brought to you by Airtel, the smartphone network. There's more entertainment tomorrow, Aisha. Sure. Enjoy I the rest wait of your show. That. Thanks so much, uh, Miss G, for bringing us entertainment. This is Joy News Prime. We'll be back with the sports segment. Entertainment News was brought. It's time to check the very latest from the sports world. And Nathaniel Atto is here. Nathaniel, we've been hearing about Premier League this, Premier League that, Charlie. <laughs> so is my heart of folk getting the chance to play at Accra all? Accra Hearts of Oak surely will play. And uh, so are the other, you know, 15 clubs who are playing so in the Premier League this season. So what's this injunction about? Well, uh, so an individual tried to uh, seek an injunction uh, to be placed on the start of the Ghana Premier League this weekend. But, um, you know, that was sought from the court. But as to whether he was able to serve it on the FA or not is one uh, that is not too clear uh, at this time. Now, uh, after the reports came out and after the injunction notice was uh, published on, on various social media platforms, this is what the Ghana FA's official Twitter handle said. The 2015-2016 Ghana Premier League will kick off this weekend in all eight match venues across the country. Well. So this is confirmation. And another confirmation came from the managers of the Premier League, the Premier League board, whose vice uh, chairman, George Amwakon, has been confirming this. The program has been outlined to start from uh, Saturday. So what, 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 what is the doubt about this? It's coming on, yeah. It, it, it is quite, uh, you know, interesting to uh, talk about the commencement of the league at this stage. Uh, it's been uh, delayed for quite some time, but it's better uh, late than never. All right, so this is the notice I was talking about, and uh, it was filed by Babia Alassan, who's the plaintiff, and of course the uh, defendant is the Ghana Football Association. So it says, notice uh, motion for interlocutory injunction. And uh, motion on notice is for an order for stay of interlocutory injunction restraining the defendant, its agents, affiliates, subsidiaries, 
from commencing the 2015-2016 Premier League season pending the final determination of this suit upon grounds stated in the affidavit annexed hereto. Uh, and for any further order or orders, as this honorable court may deem fit. Okay, so uh, this is it. And um, this was uh, obtained in Tema on uh, today's date. And of course, so that's it. But there are assurances from the FA that uh, everything will be uh, you know, uh, rolled out as has been said, and it begins from Saturday, February 20. Let's go ahead and do some more here. And the Professional Footballers Association and uh, a wing of FIFA, which is uh, prone to, you know, which is uh, oriented towards the welfare of players during and after their careers, has made a major gesture to the Premier League this season. Now, the PFAG, uh, which is headed by ex-Ghana international Tony Buffo, will pay insurance premiums for all players of all 16 clubs playing in the Ghana Premier League. I've realized uh, in my career as an administrator or manager that uh, negotiations are key and relationships are also key in uh, going forward. And of course, preparation. Uh, that's what I tell most of the, the players, the current and the former players, that uh, um, you need to prepare because life after football uh, is something totally different. What we as a professional footballers association of Ghana have done uh, is that we are going to pay the premium for the 16 uh, Premier League clubs times 30 uh, registered players for two years from our coffers so that they are fully insured. In the next four to six weeks, we will launch it, but we will coordinate an appropriate date with the PLB and the Ghana Football Association. All right, so let's uh, focus on Accra Hearts of Oak, whose uh, strategic committee has outlined uh, new uh, plans for a club, a new uh, direction for uh, the club. Now, Vincent Soa Odote is chairman of this strategic committee of Accra Hearts of Oak. Uh, the, the playing body, we are ready. I'm sure you can see that the supporters here are ready. And we are going to see a different Accra Hearts of Oak. And Accra Hearts of Oak, that will give an, a good account of itself on the field. And Accra Hearts of Oak, that will set up as a proper modern business unit so that will begin to, uh, uh, to mirror what any modern organization in terms of entertainment must, must provide. We can also announce you that our website is up and running. Please visit our website. We can also tell you that we'll be giving weekly press briefings, especially ahead of our home matches, so that you all know what you have to do. I'll plead with you and urge you to come to the stadium, come and watch the new Sushi Cup of Football. Come and watch the old Accra Hearts of Oak and come and entertain yourselves. Bring your children under 16 uh, so they can come and uh, begin to build a new generation of supporters, a new generation of stakeholders in the game so that we, uh, at least we can have the future of the game sustained. We can assure you that the, the strategy committee, this is a sub a subcommittee of the board will be doing everything professionally, totally different from what you know is about football management. I'm sure you know some of us where we want football to go, so that the shareholders, the stakeholders who have some value for money and they are uh, in, in the long run. This season, we expect to do well, and I can assure you we'll do well. And thank you. All right, so uh, they say they will do well this season. We'll hold them to it later on. Let's do quick updates from Europa League games that have been played. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them have been uh, fully played. Uh, full time scores Anderlecht versus Olympiakos. Anderlecht winning by one goal to nil. Borussia Dortmund beat uh, FC Porto 2 0. FC Midland 2. Manchester United 1. Mm. Tottenham Hotspurs and Fiorentina drew 1 1. Saint Etienne beat Basel FC. 3-2. Uh, and of course, Sevilla uh, 
uh, they beat uh, Molde by three goals to nil. VRL uh, beat uh, Napoli by one goal to nil. Liverpool and Augsburg uh, are yet to score a goal. It's 27 minutes in that game. Same amount of time played in that game between Galatasaray and Lazio, who are drawing 1-1. Marseille nil, Athletic Bilbao nil. Game in its uh, early stages. Sata Donetsk and uh, Schalke also drawing goalless. Uh, Braha have uh, taken the lead in the game against Sion, which is just about 30 minutes uh, into the game. Kra Cuban Krasnoda uh, has, uh, is drawing goalless with Sparta Prague. That game is in the 29th minute. 30 minutes played in the game between Bayer Leverkusen and uh, Sporting CP Bayer Leverkusen leading by one goal to nil. And of course, uh, Valencia uh, winning 3-0 against Rapid Vienne after 29 minutes of action. Well, let's do some uh, world football politics. And the English FA chairman, Greg Dyke, has cast doubts over the uh, presidential bid of uh, Sheikh Salman, one of five, who are looking forward to uh, landing the top job of FIFA in elections later this month. I personally have a problem with Sheikh Salman. I don't think anyone from Bahrain should be, um, should be president of, of FIFA, given... Uh, what has happened in Bahrain in, in recent years, given their attitude to human rights. I mean, there is no doubt that there were footballers in Bahrain who were put into prison because they, and tortured because they didn't agree with the regime. Now, I'm, I'm quite happy to accept that the Sheikh wasn't part of that, but he still comes from Bahrain, and I think that just is completely the wrong message for world football. Well, Greg Dyke there and the English FA say they will back uh, Gianni Infantino for the presidency. That's how we wrap it up here on the sports segment of Join News Prime here on Multi TV. Keep it here for more, which is coming up very shortly. My name is Nathaniel Lato, and I have love for sport.